Yeah, also warm welcome from my side. So Frank, I guess we have done a very good job giving a presentation in English, which uh, doesn't push me to give the presentation in French. In fact, I started with some French words last time. I will not do it this time. And there's a very good reason for that, uh, because in fact, my colleague Christoph told me you have a very, very strong and ugly German accent in your French. So I'll not punish you this time and uh, go straight on on the English side. So, um, good to be here again. Last year we talked a lot about modulation techniques, especially for 100 gig and above. Who was here? Who still remembers? Uh -huh. Very good. Who still remembers what's behind DPQPSK? Frank does. <laughs> a few. So, uh, had some impact at least. Now, in fact, which is kind of curious, uh, even talking about modulation techniques, last year I gave an outlook at the end that it's not only about putting the information on the fiber, it's also about protecting the information when we send it over the fiber. And uh, curiously, we continue with protection this year, network encryption. Um, we can also have another title here, what the heck is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman? Who knows what's that? Ah, very good, four. The others will know it at the end as well. Not too difficult. Um, just a few words about ADVA. I guess uh, most of us know who's ADVA. So we are a provider of connectivity solution, mainly optical, which is WDM and carrier Ethernet solutions. We have two main product lines there. And uh, during my presentation, I will also say some words about why Security, specifically encryption, plays a role in our portfolio as well. And it's not only a layer three and the buff topic. Good. What has changed out there? A lot of things have changed, especially the way crime happens in the cyberspace. So if you look at hackers in the past, it was very easy. So they did hacking just for fun, just for notoriety, just to show off, hey, I could break in this portal, I could do this. This has changed quite a bit now, because now they are criminal organization, organized crime behind. And there are suddenly new business models. So it's not only business to business, suddenly it's criminal to criminal. So they create crime -ver tools, they offer the service. So we come to something which is called crime as a service, so not only infrastructure as a service and those things. And um, there's a lot of money behind. So if you, you consider the hackers in the past, they didn't have a lot of money. They had cool computer gear, they had fun, but money was never an issue. Suddenly, organized crime comes in there with huge amounts of money. So it's tens and millions of dollars which are suddenly involved just to break into some networks, steal some data, do some damage, whatever it is. And it's fast expanding. And it's not only the hackers, uh, it's also some of the government organizations we know very well who are always interested in gaining some information here and there. Um, how can we secure our data, our private data? There are basically three pillars to secure it. So the first one is physical security. We know it. We know it in all our homes. We have doors, we have keys. In data center, it's a little bit different. We have fingerprint sensors in some very secret areas. We have eye sensors and all those things. So basically locking people out from getting access. The other pillar is logical security. This is something we're also using in our daily life. It's passwords on our computers. It's uh, basically segmenting the data, so not every employee has access to all the data. So those things uh, are very commonly used. The third pillar is data encryption. So this really helps strongly to protect the data, and uh, all three together is a nice toolkit for protecting private data. We won't talk about physical and logical security today. I'll talk about data encryption. Now, if we want to encrypt data, we need a mechanism for that. And those two guys, they're very creative. So they figured out, hey, we have a very strong and new encryption code. We just print the digits upside down and everything is cool. Now, maybe not because we still can read it. So we want to be a bit more fancy today talking about encryption. Um, if we talk about encryptions, it's not only the way how we encrypt the data. It's basically four components we need to look at. 
Of course, there's the way how we generate the cipher text, the encryption method. But in order to do that, we need keys. So keys that are specifying the transformation. If we have keys, we need to distribute the keys somehow in a secure way, hopefully, because if somebody can read the key, he can decrypt it and everything is useless. And we need also a component which is called authentication, because if you receive something from somebody you don't know, then it might be the hacker himself, and we are at the beginning of the whole thing. Good, so let's talk about those four things. And uh, so last time we had some mathematics stuff as well, so some math is always in there these days. We will also have some math today. But let's go back into history. So encryption is nothing new. There are historical ciphers, and probably the oldest one we know is the Caesar cipher. Very easy one. So we use pens and paper, or sometimes they even carved the stuff in stones at that time. And uh, how was it done? It was basically shifting the alphabet by a number of characters. So instead of an A, we used a D. Instead of a B, we used an E, and so on and so forth. And if both parties knew how, by how many digits the whole thing is shifted, you can encrypt it and decrypt it. So that's the easiest thing. This became a little bit more powerful, uh, in fact, developed from the German side, um, in fact, at a not so good time in history. So after World War II, there was a creative guy who developed a machine called Enigma. This machine uh, was used after World War II, but it suddenly was heavily used during World War II. And in fact, uh, by stealing some of the stuff and cracking the algorithms, uh, it hit the Germans quite a bit at the end of World War II, which uh, contributed what had happened at that point. So what did Enigma do? Very simple thing. It did something very similar to a, to a Caesar cipher on a rotator module but not shifting the alphabet linearly, it's basically arbitrarily exchanging the characters. And it was a couple of those rotators in sequence. So you started to do this five times, and then there was another very fancy thing. After each character decrypt encrypted, the whole thing rotated, shifted to a new one. So very, very fancy development at that time, very, very safe, but somehow, the Allies could capture some of those rotators and one of those machines and suddenly it happened. So that's in the past. So we don't want to talk about uh, yeah, writing it on paper or carving it in stone. We want to talk about electronic encryption. And modern ciphers, there are basically two flavors there. And the two flavors, they differ by the way keys are used. So the first one, AES, it's a symmetric key algorithm. So both sides that the encryptor and the decryptor are using the same key and RSA <laughs> is an asymmetric way they're using different keys and I'll explain a little bit about that so AES uh, in fact developed it during the late 90s uh, coming out of a contest so the US had a contest about the most secure way of encrypting data and uh, a team one who called their their algorithm in a very cryptic way already if you read this in letters in fact it's pronounced Raindell. and uh, the mechanism is very simple it's basically something like a, a matrix multiplication but a bit more developed so it's substitution elements permutation in cycles this is AES advanced encryption standard on the other side asymmetric encryption and decryption, or asymmetric keys, RSA, is named after the inventors, Rivers, Shamir, and Adleman. And uh, here the mathematics comes into the game. So we have a modulo calcula calculation. You all know what it is? So basically we, we just uh, take the rest which cannot be achieved by division. So if we have 10 modulo 7, the answer is 3, because subtract 7, three is left, if you have 11, it's four, and so on and so forth. Encryption is very simple. You achieve your cipher by, by taking your message, M here, to the power of E, which is your encryption key, and then calculating the modulus with N. Decrypting, you take the, the, the uh, cipher, C, 
to the power of D, the decryption key, so the encryption key and the decryption key are different, and you arrive back at the message. This is how it works. Um, another difference between symmetric and asymmetric keys is also if you want to communicate with multiple persons. So if I want to co communicate with my colleague Stefano with a symmetric algorithm, I need a separate key pair for both of us, because otherwise you guys could listen to it easily. So for each communication I have, I need a key. Now, with asymmetric encryption, it's different, because I have a private key. I, I'm the only guy knowing the private key, and there's a public key. Everybody can know it. And by that, I only have one pair of keys, private and public, and each of you has a pair of keys, and by that, we can exchange information in a secure way. Now, let us see how this works. RSA, how do we generate those keys? So first we start, very simple thing, um, still easy to understand. We pick two numbers, prime numbers in that way, P and Q. Then we compute the modulus we are using then, still simple, P times Q. Then, gets a bit more difficult, Euler's totient function, it's nothing else than P minus one times Q minus one. And then we need to choose an integer, E. So basically, it, our public key is the E. And it has to be between 1 and the Totion function. And both E and the Totion function need to be co-prime. So not too difficult. I'll show you how this goes. And then we need to determine our private key, the key we maintain or keep ourselves and never disclose. And that's simply the result of E times D equal to 1 modulus N. So very standard calculation, we can do it on a computer very easily, not too much effort. Um, some numbers behind, prime numbers P61, Q53. Now, our modulus, P times Q, 3233. Three, three. Totion function, 3120. Then uh, the integer we choose as our public key, which is used for encryption on the counterpart side. We pick 17, it's co-prime to 3120, just believe me, it is. And then we determine our private key, D, which is 2753. So we have those numbers, and now we can send messages in an encrypted way that nobody can read them. Works in a very, very easy way. So our counterpart is using our public key to encrypt the data. So M, the message, to the power of 17. 17 is our public key. Modulus 3233. And uh, we decrypt it. So here's also the first typo on my slides. Who can see it? Nobody? The modulus should be the same. Also in the second line it should be 3233. It's the N. So in order to decrypt it, we take what's coming from the other side to the power of our private key, here we go. Example, our message is 65 to the power of 17, modulus 3233 three, three gives us the 2790. If I want to decrypt it, I'm taking to the power of my private key, 2753, take the modulus, ends up at 65. So we have keys to encode messages. Fantastic. Now, there's a bit more behind because there's one challenge with this asymmetric um, key exchange and encryption and decryption of data. Computation-wise, it's much more effort than the classical AES algorithm, which is more or less a matrix mul multiplication. So if you want to go at high speed, if you want to go high throughput, if you want to go low computational effort, we want to have a symmetric key in order to encrypt and decrypt the data. It's much easier to program, much less computational effort. But the way to exchange the keys, uh, we want to keep it asymmetric, because that's fairly safe. And this is where we come to the first thing, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So this is basically a combination of uh, the asymmetric and the symmetric piece, which is used in many modern computing systems today. And uh, we have three parties here. We have Alice and Bob, they want to communicate with each other, and we have Eve in the middle, who is the eavesdropper. 
So it used to be Eve for many years. Um, since two years, Eve got a new name. Who guess? What's her new name? It's called NSA now. So what do they do? Very simple thing. So they agree on prime numbers. P and the base for it, G. Can be public. Doesn't matter. Everybody can know it. And then they start to compute their private and their public key. So Alice starts and says, hey, my secret integer or my secret key is A. And then she sends a message with uh, capital A, which is basically G to the power of A modulus P to Bob, which is the public key. Now Bob does the same, picks an integer, secret, his private key, does the same calculation, sends it to Alice. So now Bob has the public key of Alice, Alice has the public key of Bob, and both still own their private key. Now, they do a very simple computation there, which is uh, the public key of the other party times their private key, modulus B. So Alice does it, and Bob does it. And interestingly, if you do this calculation, no matter what is A and B and P and G, they all arrive at the same S. So this is the shared secret. And this is used to encrypt and decrypt in a symmetric way. So we have the AAS key suddenly. Much easier to compute. Um, unfortunately, there is one issue with that, and uh, it comes back to Eve or NSA now. If they are sitting in the middle, they could basically interact a little bit here by establishing two distinct key exchanges here. So instead of Alice communicating with Bob, Alice is suddenly communicating with Eve, and Eve with Bob, just pretending, hey, I'm the other one. Um, so they're masquerading. And that's not very good, because then suddenly it's open. So if you have an eavesdropper who can sit right in the middle there, and who could be a fake Alice or a fake Bob, you have a problem. And uh, how can we solve this? This is solved by the fourth piece in our equation. It's solved by authentication. So we really need to know, hey, this message is coming from Bob, or this message is coming from Eve. It's not coming from, ah, not sorry, not Eve, Alice and Bob. And this is authentication, and this is done in a very simple way. Um, it's a very complicated environment, but can be described easily. So there's something called a certificate authority. We also have this in the internet. There are a couple of certificate authorities there. So if you do your private banking and so on, you need some anchor of trust, which is the certificate authority. And you know the key of this one. It's well known. And you get certificates which guarantee that this is the key from the other party, from Alice or Bob. So that's basically how it works. So we have trusted anchors in, in the network. And there are a couple of those in the internet. And this is basically done in every security environment nowadays. Good, this is how it works. Um, now we have a mechanism to encrypt. We have a mechanism to exchange keys. We can authenticate. Now the question is, what do we do with it? So there are basically two ways of encrypting data. One is encrypting data at rest, basically when we store it. The other one is encrypting data in motion, encrypting it when we transport it. Um, they are a little bit different but they're typically used together in all modern communication environments. Now, encrypting data at rest when we store this is something which is proactive, has basically two main drawbacks. The first one is the responsibility is pushed to the data owners, and the second one is you must keep the keys as long as you want to read the data. If you lose the key, you will never read the encrypted data again. It's gone forever. For data in motion, it's, it's a different thing. It's preventative. So basically, we encrypt the data before we transport it. We decrypt it when it arrives. So we protect it when it travels a network. And we have session keys only. So once it is decrypted on the receiving side, there's no need to maintain the key. So we can have new keys very frequently, which increases the security level. That's no problem. We can have high application performance in those things. So that's why typically encrypting data in motion is preferred. Also, if you have many people who need to access the data, 
then uh, encrypting data address is difficult because everybody needs to have the keys. If you swap the keys, everybody needs to know the new keys. So it's kind of complicated. Um, so securing data in motion by encryption, we can do this on different levels in our network, different uh, OSI levels, basically. What's very common these days is using IPsec on layer three on the IP layer. That's a very common mechanism. We have everything built in in our laptops, in every modern communication device, you can find that. Um, there are some challenges with that. We'll come to this in a minute. What's coming more and more into business today is encrypting data at the lower layer. So it's on the transport layer, layer one, or on the data link layer, the Ethernet layer. So this has quite some, some benefits in terms of throughput, latency, and so on. And uh, just some figures here for comparison. If we encrypt on layer one, which is for us the optical layer, so basically encrypting all the bits we are sending over the fiber, then uh, we introduce very little latency. It's less than 150 nanoseconds. So that's peanuts. You won't even read that. Um, you can also achieve very high throughput here, up to 100 gigabit. No contention, literally no overhead. On the Ethernet, the or the carry Ethernet level, it's uh, still very low latency. It's below five microseconds here. Still fast, little bit overhead. On the IPsec level, changing a bit. It's in the millisecond range. So if you want to have high performance communication, gets a bit difficult here. But there are also other reasons, and we will see this in a second. Now that's the basics, and uh, now I want to continue with the top five moves of network encryption. So there are some messages around where we say, yeah, it's like that, but it's not really like that. And this is the next couple of slides. The first one is transport networks are secure. So if you look a couple of years back, then everybody said, hey, that's fiber, you can't tap fiber, you can't read what's on the fiber. That's the securest media which is available for transporting data. In fact, there are still a lot of operators in the world going to their customers and tell them, hey, you need fiber access because it's more secure than copper or whatever. Um, might be, but it's not secure. And there are good examples. I have three of them with me. So the first one was published in The Guardian last year. Um, it was the UK government communications headquarters who had the idea of tapping 200 fiber optic cables at the same time. And uh, yeah, this allowed them to read 600 million communications every day. So quite a li little bit of nice data you can have and sift and store and do fancy thing with that. Um, but the project called Tempora ran for 18 months. So Tempora sounds a little bit like temporary. Um, 18 months is quite a long time. So they got a lot of access to data. So this really happens. And uh, there's more here, Spiegel Online. It's a German portal. There was also an article, and uh, this is about the BND, the Bundesnachrichtendienst. So that's the German secret service and the NSA here. So since spying alone might be a bit boring, they thought, hey, let's team up and let's uh, look at some data and let's get some cool information there. So they tapped fiber optic cables. It's not totally clear where this happened. So usually if this happens, uh, which is very government driven often, then it doesn't get dis disclosed completely. So, but definitely it ha happened. Not sure why and where, but they did it. So that's on the layer one level, where you read all the information. Um, what's even easier is if you do something on the packet layer, layer two. So there are even more possibilities. And uh, here's a good example, also shown on the British portal here. And here the Brits come again into the game. Um, and they thought, hmm, let's buy out what the Belgians are doing. So what they basically did is they placed uh, high performance servers on uh, internet uh, exchange points or switching points and started a man in the middle attack. So what they are did on these servers is they put on faked LinkedIn pages. So and obviously, the Brits have very good content on the LinkedIn side or on the fake LinkedIn side. And the guys from Belgacom laughed it quite a bit. So they locked on on those fake things. And then yeah, they could get access to a lot of uh, passwords and other stuff. And at the end, compromised the power network. So you can see 
there's a lot of criminal energy behind uh, getting access to data, getting access to network. And it's not necessarily reading the data only, it's partially also really putting some damage in it. So taking a network down on other things. Myth number one. Myth number two, IPsec is sufficient for network encryption. So we touched this a little bit. Um, there are a lot of drawbacks there. Doesn't mean that we don't need IPsec anymore. So we still need it. So for low, for low bandwidth connections, for example, what we do in the internet, if we go to our private bank and all those things, we still need it. But for corporate connectivity, for example, for high-speed connectivity, it's not the right solution. And just a couple of technical aspects here. First one we had already, delay is measured in milliseconds instead of microseconds or nanoseconds. Efficiency is a very critical one. So just assume you are leasing a line between two facilities of your organization. If you use IPsec for encrypting your data, you add something like 50% additional bandwidth to it. So you need to lease twice the capacity. It's extra cost. Scalability is an issue. So definitely doesn't scale up to 10 or 100 gigabits. It's something for a few megabits only. Um, speed, not in terms of capacity, speed in terms of connection establishment and so on and so forth is a difficult one here, which doesn't matter a lot if we have uh, small applications and we can wait for that, but for a high performance computing environment, this simply doesn't work, like grid computing and all those things. Um, compatibility, there are some challenges here, so it's not so easy to go through a, a network address translation with a standard IPsec. We need some fancy stuff. And the biggest issue, it doesn't scale easily because it simply needs to scale with uh, the number of endpoints, with the number of users and applications you have in your network. If you encrypt on the connectivity layer, so transport or Ethernet, you just have one pipe and you can run through hundreds of connections no matter what. Now coming to our elliptic curve, myth number three. We need the elliptic curve because it's more secure. No, it's not true. We need it in some instances, and I will tell you in a minute about it. So the first one, asymmetric encryption. We talked about it before. It's basica basically based on an assumption, and the assumption is that there are mathematical problems which are easy to calculate in one direction, but very difficult to calculate in the other direction. And this is what basically RSA is using in a linear way. So they say, and that's true, that it's much more difficult to factor a large integer in its two prime numbers or prime factors than computing the multiplication of the two primes. So if you look at the right-hand side, multiplication, 3,607 times 3,803, I think that's easy. We even can do it with a piece of paper. We don't need a computer or, or pocket computer or whatever for that. If somebody gives you the number 13,717,421 and asks you, hey, please tell me what the two prime factors are, I think we might need a couple of days in order to figure this out with a pen and a piece of paper. And that's simply the principle behind. So that's a linear way of doing it. Now, instead of going on a linear axis, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we can go in a two-dimensional room and we can add or embed an elliptic curve in that. And then it becomes a little bit more challenging in order to decrypt the stuff. So basically, we are defining a, a discrete logarithm of a random elliptic curve, which is publicly known. And then knowing the base point, the question is, which one is the next point on this curve? <coughs> Quite challenging. It's okay if you know what the curve is. If you don't know the curve, it's more or less impossible. Now, is this more secure? No, it's not more secure. The main benefit you have from the elliptic curves is that your key length gets much shorter to achieve the same level of security. So here you see comparison. If you do RSA, and the typical key lengths which are used today is uh, 124, 248, now moving a bit into 372. And if you compare it to an elliptic curve security level, you see the numbers here, it's just in the hundreds. So that's not a big deal if we have powerful security 
equipment there. But it's a big deal if we are using devices everybody has in his pocket. You know what I mean? We all have credit cards with a chip on. Not a lot of storage space there. Not a lot of bandwidth to retrieve the data from the chip or from the card. So we need something which is more efficient. And on all of our, encrypt on our credit cards with a chip on, you find elliptic curve encryption. This is where it's used and where it has benefits. Good, myth number four. Ah, post-quantum security is needed today. So first, I guess I have to define what do we mean by post-quantum security. I think all of you have heard about quantum computers, which are using the quantum mechanical phenomena in order to do certain calculations. They are not existing today, but people are promising that they will be available at some point. So they can solve some specific problems much faster, more quickly than the classical computers we have today. And uh, two examples for that is search in large databases. So they can do this much better than a standard computer and integer factorization. Remember what we talked about? Integer factorization. So we have this big number, find the two prime factors. So they can do this much faster, which might give us some struggle if we continue using those things. So we are lucky that those computers are not there and will not be there in the next five years. Um, even the NSA has doubts when this will come. There are some experiments in the lab. It's promising that we will see it, but uh, it will not happen anytime soon. And this is what we call the post-quantum era. So once we have quantum computers, we need to think about what we do on the cryptography, si cryptography side in order to protect our data from those capabilities. So the NSA has started a program, for example, recommending that uh, something has to be changed over the next five years because of those quantum computers becoming available. But this is just a recommendation and there is at the moment just the investigation going on what this could be and how this could look like. So we don't need this today. Nevertheless, there is something with quantum on the cryptography side already today. Um, not heavily used, but it's available. And this is called quantum key distribution. It has nothing to do with cryptography. It's just about, no, wrong. It has nothing to do with quantum computing. It's just about the key distribution. So we learned that there's one issue. If you distribute keys and somebody is able to read the message where the key is in there, then we are deep shit. So we need to find mechanisms which are really secure if we distribute the keys. And one of those is quantum key distribution. Um, it's built on a very simple, even so complex phenomena. And this is, if we code our information into photons, single photons. So if we send something a bit over fiber today, then we use a lot of photons in order to put this information in there. And some photons get lost because of attenuation, whatever happens in the fiber, but we use huge amounts of photons to code a bit. But there's a way of just putting our information in one photon. And photons, they have a spin. They can spin left and they can spin right. So if we say spin left means one, spin right means zero, we can transfer information using single photons. The nice thing with photons is, if somebody takes them out to read them, they're gone. So the information is gone. And you will see this on the receiving side. And the even nicer phenomena is, if somebody watches them, he's changing the state of the photon. So there's no way of watching a photon without changing the state. So that's physics. And by that, it's simply impossible to transfer information. When somebody looks at it, it's not valid anymore. You can see it in some checksums or whatever you do. And this is something we have done with a partner called Toshiba and uh, with BT in a field trial. So we had a first, uh, inst not installation, a first demo about half a year ago using a 10 gig solution. Now we have repeated that just recently with 100 gig. So basically what you see on top, WDM system with 100 gig with our encryption stuff, 
but now instead of using the classical Diffie-Hellman and so on key exchange, we use this uh, quantum key exchange QKD from Toshiba to exchange the keys in the most secret way you can get. So there's no way to hack it, feed it back into our system and suddenly we have a secure environment. So that's kind of R&D stuff. That's nothing anybody would deploy. It's far too complicated. It's far too expensive to have that. Even though there are some companies around who uh, yeah, promote that this might be a commercial product soon. So there's interest. Yes, there's some time we will need that, but that's high-end technology. Last one, myth number five, getting closer to the end. Crypto terminology is cryptic. No, it isn't. Um, I think you've learned quite a bit now. It's easy to understand if we keep it simple. And this is some, some advertisement also for us. So basically, it's sufficient to understand the basics here. And yes, there are a lot of passwords and acronyms we need to get at some point. But there's ways to protect all this from the user. And that's basically what we have done in our solutions. So we have encryption solutions on layer one and on layer two, FSP 3000, FSP 150. You can talk to our guys who are around. We have a table over there. We ha can get more details here. And what we basically have done there is we, we shielded all the crazy stuff from the user. So you can still do the configurations you need. It's still safe as any everything else is, but it's not as cryptic. So this gets me to the very end here. And uh, <coughs> cryptography, we are also using in our private lives, all of us, especially the males among us. If you look at the, these guys, it's for securing family relationships because the male persons, especially I, I'm one of them, we tend to encrypt our emotion to protect our marriage. So there are lots of complaints from the female part about that, but please understand it's encryption, it's security, nothing else. Good, that's the end. Um, no outlook as last time what might come on top, so I leave it open what we might present next year in this audience. Thanks for your attention. I hope it was some fun and you learned something out of that. And I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Hello, thank you for this enlightening uh, presentation. Um, what is your currently best practice advice for key distribution in, um, let's say, very few overhead dollar uh, for uh, optical core. So basically, uh, what we are using on on the layer one and layer two side, on layer one, basically, it's inbuilt in the system. So you basically use the overhead for the key for the key distribution, or on the layer two, you use a packet <coughs> stream in order to do that on the layer two side. Of course, there's also other ways which brings us to the way of integrating in a public key infrastructure where you receive the keys from the outside. So this is a bit more complicated. We don't recommend this if you don't have a PKI, a public key infrastructure, installed today. So there are some organizations who have it and who want to include the transmission part into it. <laughs> but uh, as long as you don't have that and you don't want to fiddle around with all those crazy things, we recommend to have this inbuilt in the security environment. You can still manage this from a central point, but uh, you don't have to fiddle around with all these complex things. That's what I meant with my myth number five, cryptography is cryptic. More questions? I'm around for the rest of the day. Thanks again, and yeah, let's talk later. Thank you. whatsoever because everyone is just receiving unicast and we really increase the security uh, for different aspects um, was that because the pricing of the submarine cable uh, capacity was so high most of the countries that had access to these cables were largely dependent 